Good evening and happy Monday. Welcome to the American Promise Monthly Conference Call for July 2019. It's 8 p.m. here on the East Coast, July 8th, 2019. Um, my name is Rosie, as most of you know, and I'm one of the Citizen Empowerment Coordinators with American Promise. Thank you all so, so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this call, a call that happens on the second Monday of each month. So whether you're tuning in live or listening to this recording afterwards, you're all a really crucial part in the fight to save our democracy, so truly thank you. Uh, tonight we're joined by Azer Cole, uh, my wonderful coworker, state manager for American Promise, and New Hampshire state settler, Melanie Nuvesk, who will be leading a discussion on New Hampshire's recent victory in becoming the 20th state to call for a constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics. After we hear from the senator, I will pass it over to Ellen Greenbush, the leader of Port Clinton, Ohio, APA, who will share tips on writing successful letters to the editor and op-eds, as her group has now successfully published over 55 media pieces, which is all really, really exciting. From there, we'll go into the month's action, writing letters to the editor, generating support for HJ Res 2, and also celebrating New Hampshire's recent victory. We'll then lead a brief training and brainstorm on why getting your entire APA to our big gatherings this October in Washington, D.C., the National Citizens Leadership Conference, is really important. We'll help you invite people from neighboring congressional districts to come as well. And then finally, we'll role play a conversation on what we need to do to get people to come to the NCLC. I'd like to start by just sharing a few interesting statistics to remind us why we're all here tonight. So... During election day June, some of you may have caught it, the DNC hosted the first of 12 debates for the Democratic candidates for president. All the candidates also recently shared their second quarter fundraising amounts, and the data is really staggering. So, so far, the amount of candidates, the amount raised by candidates is $219.8 million, and that's just in the first six months of this year, $219.8 million. Pete Buttigieg came out on top. He raised $24.8 million in the second quarter. And so far, as of last week, our, uh, the president, uh, Donald Trump, he is, his re-election campaign has raised $93,425,387, which is just really a staggering and shocking amount of money. And this is not good. This is a disgusting amount of money in our elections. And it really wasn't always this way. In 1984, Ronald Reagan ran for re-election without holding a single fundraiser. Congress also hasn't passed a significant campaign finance reform bill since 2002, the McCain-Feingold bill that bans soft money. So with this, we recognize that our system is being fixed by the millionaires, billionaires, and artificial entities that we're just not going to stand for. In the three years since American Promise has launched, we've met with hundreds of congresspeople, senators, and other elected officials across the country who have committed to the fight for this cause, just as you and I have. Last month's debate was exciting because serious contenders for president stood on the same side as us and cried out against big money influencing our government. We still have a long way to go until the 2020 election, something like 480 days, I believe, um, and regardless of who is elected, American Promise will still be here fighting to ensure that all of our voices are heard and that we have a democracy we can count on. So with that really staggering and kind of depressing statistics, I'd like to now introduce my coworker, Azer Cole, who will lead the discussion with Ben Levesque. Great. Thank you, Rosie. And I hope it's more invigorating and motivating than depressing for everyone on this call. It's always fun to be on this call with, with everyone across the country, and I'm particularly excited for this one, uh, just to have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker tonight, New Hampshire State Senator Melanie Levake. It was really her leadership in the New Hampshire State Senate that was just crucial to the passage of HB 504, which, as Rosie said, is the bill that made New Hampshire the 20th state calling for an amendment to the Constitution to get big money out of politics. And interestingly, it also had a provision um, calling for the codification of partisan gerrymandering to be outlawed in the Constitution as well. And throughout the legislative process, Senator Levesque's office was easy to reach, her staff informed and helpful, and more than anything, her determination to see this people-powered reform through to the finish line, unwavering. Before becoming a state senator, she served for three terms as a state representative in New Hampshire for Brookline, Hollis, and Mason, 
And currently, in addition to being a state senator, she currently serves as a member of the Hollis Brookline School Board, as a member of the New Hampshire Endowment for Health, the Health Advisory Committee, and as a trustee for the town of Brookline and trustee for the Brookline Community Church. And she's currently taking time out of what is clearly a well-earned vacation to talk with us tonight. Senator Levesque, you're talking with people across the country working to ensure that political power correlates with one's vote, not one's bank account. People like Ellen Green Bush in Ohio, who we'll hear from later, who's working with their state reps and senators right now to introduce what you just helped pass in New Hampshire. You're talking to people like Ashwari Sola, who've been Santa Fe, New Mexico, who built off her state's recent legislative victory by passing a local resolution, doubling down on that message through the Santa Fe City Council. It's just an idea of the kind of people you're talking to. And everyone, as Senator Levesque is talking, please be thinking of questions. You can raise your hand by pressing one on your keypad. And with that, Senator Levesque, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you, Azar. And thank you, Rosie. And thank you, everybody who's on the line today. Um, so I happen to be the chair of election law, which is very exciting. And um, passing HB 504, which was our bill, um, really was very gratifying. Previously, 82 towns in New Hampshire passed warrant articles to get money out of politics. And my town of Brookline was one of those towns. So I had a passion for this to begin with, and I was definitely interested. Um, also, another thing is that there is very strong constituent support for this particular bill. And we saw that as Azor advocated and many others um, advocated for the bill. So um, I want to give a I want to give a shout out to to um, ah, she called me like every day or every week. Azor, you're thinking of Kareen Dodge, yeah. Kareen Dodge, yes, to Kareen. Thank you, Kareen. Her passion was just undeniable, and she is. Um, just an outstanding advocate, but there are many people like Corrine that push this effort. So um, HB 504 was brought forward by Representative Marjorie Smith, who is a dynamo in the House of Representatives. And I knew that when Marjorie was behind the bill that we had something solid. As Azar mentioned, there are three parts. One of them is getting money out of politics, getting rid of overturning Citizens United, the second was redistricting on a federal level, and the third part was holding a listening session in New Hampshire so that we could bring this information to our congressional delegation. We did run up against some challenges in the Senate. First of all, uh, there was objection to the redistricting piece because we recently passed a redistricting bill. And um, actually, that's what, I'm sorry, uh, Marjorie was, on the redistricting bill. So um, this was really important and it was very complex. So uh, Representative Smith brought forth the redistricting bill. And we did pass it. Um, it has not been signed by the governor yet, but it passed the House and the Senate. The, the concern about that was that because we had passed a bill for redistricting for our state, some felt that doing a national redistricting was not important. Um, certainly, I felt very differently. And this bill really supports the federal level, which supports all of our country, all of our state. The second objection was to the listening se session. Some felt that the Senate should not be doing the federal delegation's job by holding this listening session. And again, I felt like it was very important because there are so many people that are passionate about this issue and their words and their views have got to be bubbled up from us to our federal delegation. And then third was the desire to change the bill in some way, removing certain sections. And what we heard very loudly from our advocates that was very important is that any changes that we made to this bill that passed the House in a 
bipartisan fashion could be the death of the bill. And that's what we had seen happen in the past. So we urged those that supported the bill not to take it apart and pass the whole bill as it was. So it did pass the Senate on a party line vote and now it's awaiting the governor's signature. So our next steps are, first of all, we want the governor to sign HB 504. And then next year, we're talking about bringing forth a constitutional amendment in our state. And I think the important thing about making it a constitutional amendment is that we're really getting down to the grassroots level. We're hearing from the people and a lot of people are just aching for this, this type of reform. So if we do it on a constitutional level, everyone will have input to it. And I just want to close by sharing with you um, my experience meeting Eric Holder, who was President Obama's Attorney General. And he talked about the importance of redistricting. And I can say that I, for one, I'm in a gerrymandered district but he talked about how it perpetuates the perception and sometimes it's a reality that government does not work for our people. When you have gerrymandered districts, it means that you would have more primaries and you would have more extreme people from the right or the left running against somebody who was willing to vote with the other party. When we elect people from the right, the far right and the far left, that means that many times legislators will not work together and government does not seem to work for the people. So this is, I thought it was brilliant how he drew the line between gerrymandering and how the government does not work. And it's not to say that we don't need people on the far left or far right. We have a whole myriad of um, you know, diversity and diversity of ideas, diversity of thought. But the problem is when you don't elect somebody because they work with others, then we have a government that does not work. So um, very happy to be here tonight sharing this with you and um, I'm open to any questions that you might, might have. And I hope you're still with me. Uh-oh. Sorry. Thank you so, so much, Senator. I was on mute for a second. It's Rosie here. Okay, <laughs> good. I thought... Phone problem? <laughs> but he'll call back in just okay. a second. Uh, that was such a great story. I see that um, people already have hands up for questions, but I just see... I have one question I wanted to ask. Um, before you were state senator, you played a role in passing a local resolution calling for a similar amendment in your New Hampshire community. Uh, can you talk about the power of local resolutions and how they kind of build momentum for issues up through the levels of government? Yeah, it's really, really important because that is where the grassroots really begins with your local, um, your local elections and local warrant articles, especially in small towns like so many that we have. The first time that we brought forward this article, it actually failed because really? the other side, it failed because the other side was, they were rallied and they stepped oh. up and they spoke against it saying that, you know, this would be um, uncertain for businesses and what about the effect on businesses and just some of the arguments really did not make any sense. So we, we tried it again the next year and we made sure that we got the message out and we had people that would be there to speak for us. So it's very, very important to rally the troops, find like-minded people to come in and vote uh, at your town meeting. Um, this time, some of the same people got up and they spoke against uh, overturning Citizens United, but their arguments were, they were inane. They were just totally ridiculous, and we were able to win the day because we had enough people who understood what was going on 
and enough people who had been educated on what was going on. So we, we did manage to pass it. Perfect. Oh, that's really important. I see like a lot of uh, our APA members and other volunteers like are interested in learning more about local resolutions because they're really, really effective. Ashwari Solaheb from uh, New Mexico has done one of them, and we have people working towards it in Ohio. So hearing your story, New Hampshire's story, it has to be really, really inspiring. I see a couple hands up, but I just want to ask one more question. Can I, can I, yeah, can I add one more thing? Now, we passed it in our towns, but our state government killed it. They would not even hear the bill. But it's still important that we passed it in our towns because we got more and more people to understand what this was about. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Absolutely. But we're, we're still, that's a really important point. Thank you for bringing that up because a lot of people are still, well, we're grateful to like local resolutions and state resolutions and even federal candidates like talking about this issue. There's still a lot of people. I was talking about what I do at a barbecue this weekend and I was asked like, What's Citizens United? Um, some people just like don't know. Um, so mm -hmm. doing that work and working on the grassroots level and informing your community is just one of the most important things that you can do right about now. Um, I want to ask one more question, and then I, hands are like flying. I'm really excited to get to these questions. Uh, American Promise's goal is to make supporting this amendment a cross-partisan issue, both parties can get behind. You mentioned earlier how it is important to work with people that, or rather vote for people that can work with people. Uh, even though this passed on a party line vote in the New Hampshire Senate, as much as possible, we always encourage our volunteer base to approach advocacy to Democrats and Republicans with an open mind. Is there anything that you can say to drive that point home? It would, I'm sure it'd be really powerful. Well, I think that at the grassroots level, then it is much easier to get more people on board, Republicans and Democrats because we're just people at that level. We're not politicians. So I would say to have a strong focus there. And once you get people of different parties together, then perhaps they can speak to their, for example, Republican representatives and speak to the importance of it. That's great. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, Azer's back on. Azer, are you okay? I am, yeah. I've, I've I had a little bit of a technical difficulty, and I was saying into my phone, Senator Blake, are you still there? Senator Blake, are you still oh. there? And then I realized I was the one that was gone, which was you by far there. the better <laughs> option, but I'm back on the call. So. <laughs> well, we're glad to okay. have you back. Thank you. Were there, uh, before we go to the group to ask some questions, was there anything that you wanted to ask, Azer? I don't want to steal your thunder. Well, well, tell me, well, tell me if I'm repeating myself at all, but I always think it's helpful when we have elected officials on these calls to ask if there are any, you know, tips that you would recommend, Senator Levesque, to, you know, people having meetings with their own elected officials, be them, you know, state reps, state senators, members of Congress, city councilmen and women, any, you know, best practices that, can go into making a meeting as effective as possible um, is always really helpful insight to have. Well, I, I think it's uh, important to talk to everyone, especially if they're your representative. Um, so regardless of what party, you should you know, have those conversations. It's also important to show that this can be detrimental to any party. So it's not like it, it favors one party or another. And if you could bring some examples of how it has been detrimental to both parties, um, then that would be helpful. It would help them see that it's not just a um, you know, partisan issue. Yeah, absolutely. I think that open-mindedness is key. You, know, yeah. you never want to and assume you know what your elected official thinks before you walk in that door. Another thing is you might not want to call it Citizens United, you know, trying to mm -hmm. overturn Citizens United, but getting, getting dark money out of politics. Um, you also help to coach us on that as well. Yeah, you know, we've found the same thing, you know, that Citizens United has become sort of a polarized term, unfortunately, and if you can articulate it in other ways, that's 
usually best. Um, great. Well, we've got just a ton of hands up, Senator. So let's start hearing from folks. Uh, let's start with Ellen. Ellen, if you could just say where you're calling in from and, and what your question is, you're unmuted here. Fort Clinton, Ohio. Actually, Rosie kind of um, asked my question. I, I was interested in the, the fact that you that it was passed in the Senate by a, a, a one party a party line vote. Um, here in Ohio, we have super majority Republican House and Senate, and so um, if we're going to get anything done in Ohio, we definitely are going to have to have Republicans on board. Um, so, but but uh, another question that I had was, um, how we've we've uh, introduced two resolutions to two small cities near us. One city passed the local resolution, and they saw it within their sort of jurisdiction to do something like that. But the other small city said they didn't think they should be. Uh, that this was something a city council should be doing. Do you ha have any suggestions for uh, convincing smaller cities and towns that their councils should be speaking up on a matter like this? Yes, that's a good question, Ellen. I would say that I would not leave it up to your elected officials. If people at the grassroots level feel strongly about it, they should all speak to their, their elected officials. And there must be a way to demand this. For example, warrant articles, you have to have like 25 signatures. So that could be a way of um, convincing the town council that this is important by gathering signatures to bring to them and say, now here we have 50 signatures of people that want us to, to take action. So um, that can be very powerful. Okay. Uh, up the, the pressure, so to speak, then on the council. Yeah, yeah. Do it at the grassroots level, oh. just collect those signatures. And if the voice of the people is strong enough, then they should be listening. Or they, there are elections, right? So maybe they don't mm -hmm. get elected next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes makes perfect sense. It's all about translating the political power of people into the political power that elected officials are most responsive to. Let's go uh, next to Nancy Morgan. Nancy, where are you calling in from and what's your question? Hi, everybody. Nancy Morgan from Northern Virginia. I th we all think this in what's happening in New Hampshire is absolutely fantastic. And my question relates to what Rosie had said about the, the local resolutions and then the bipartisan um, uh, going through the Senate or the House. And it relates to Ellen's question, too. So if you had resolutions in Virginia, they had some move to amend, have some resolutions, and they're on the books and nothing has really happened because of that. How do you uh, how do you move beh past the resolution to really influence legislators? Well, um, did the did the um, legislation pass at the local level? You said it did pass, right? Yeah, in certain places, move to amend. This was in 2012. So we're looking at mm -hmm. it and we're wondering. Well, we're going to look at other places, maybe more rural places, but we want to use those resolutions and we're not quite sure how even like if we move to make a have a resolution in an area what needs to happen afterwards to influence legislators mm -hmm. well in new hampshire every every bill that we bring has to have a hearing so i would say that if you can work with your legislators to introduce a bill then um, hopefully it would have a hearing like we do in, in New Hampshire. Uh, but also, you can still have multiple resolutions. So um, in some of our towns in New Hampshire, people have brought this issue of Citizens United 
several times, even when it's passed, they still bring it again. And it could be as a result of their state legislature not taking any action. So the resolution may say something about how you want the state legislators to take action and speak to the federal level. Mm -hmm. So and Senator, again, Senator Levesque, if, go sorry, go on. And I've got one small point to add once you're finished. No, I was just going to recap what I said that, you know, do the local resolution, but also find a legislator who will sponsor that bill. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the key things I thought that happened in New Hampshire was when there were public hearings for a bill, you know, we made sure that every elected official on, on Senator LeBake's committee knew exactly how many local resolutions had been done previously and made sure that all members of the Senate and um, New Hampshire House were, you know, getting that information sent to them multiple times because sometimes, you know, people would do all the good work to win resolutions and then won't do the work to, you know, follow up with elected officials and make sure they they really understand that that's been done. So that's certainly a key piece to say emphasize and emphasize repeatedly. Um, another we've got another a thing that we do in New Hampshire is that we have people with signs that stand outside of the um, the representatives hall and outside of the Senate with signs saying, you know, pass 504. And it just shows that citizen activism. So that's very mm -hmm. helpful as well. Absolutely. Um, we've got a couple hands up. Let's go next to Kathy Nelson. Kathy, where are you calling in from and what's your question? I'm from Northern Virginia also. And my question is how long it took you to um, have it, the 82 towns pass the resolutions? Uh, thank you for your question, Kathy. Um, let's see, we had done this about six years ago. That's when we did our first one. So I'm, I'm going to say, and Azor, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've been at it for at least six years. Yeah, you know, definitely one builds on the other. I think it's certainly possible to have legislative victories like the one in New Hampshire without that many resolutions. Um, certainly worth trying. I know in, in Santa Fe or in, in New Mexico through the state legislature, um, very similar legislation was passed last year with, without having had, you know, 80 resolutions. But, you know, they certainly are powerful tools for one, spreading awareness and two, you know, getting the attention of elected officials. Yeah, and I don't, um, I don't think it would take quite as long because more and more people understand what money in politics means, what Citizens United and redistricting, much mm -hmm. more common. Yeah. All right, let's go next to David McDermott. David, where are you calling in from, and what's your question? Hi, Azer. Uh, my name is Dave McDermott. I am in Ohio. I'm a new member of this organization. Um, and a uh, couple of questions concerning contacting of state legislators. Um, first question, uh, Senator Levesque, and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, the uh, state of New Hampshire is a democratic state, I believe, based on uh, the state legislature. Is that correct? We have a mixed government. We have a democratic House and Senate and a Republican governor. Oh. And also we have a democratic uh, executive council. council. Okay. Um, in meeting with uh, legislators, uh, a, mem a member of our group in Cincinnati uh, got some very good assistance from Ellen, uh, Ellen Greenbush, the first person to speak tonight. Uh, and as you may have learned, uh, Ohio has a slightly different profile politically. Uh, mm -hmm. And our goal in meeting with legislators was to uh, identify Republicans who would be willing to speak out and support the concept of uh, making for a fair government process by eliminating dark money. Uh, and um, wondering if you think that is a worthwhile exercise or based on your experience, do you think that 
uh, we should concentrate on the local level where we may have a better uh, degree of success. Thanks. Well, you know, I, I think you have to do both. Um, however, the local level is really going to be critical because it puts the pressure on the representatives. And it also educates the populace. So um, local level is a must. Um, talk, finding a representative that will support the bill is also very important if you want to take it to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. You know, can't emphasize the two-pronged strategy doing both at the same time enough. And I think we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. Let's go to um, Sharon, Sharon Torrance, who's had her hand up for a while. Sharon, where are you calling in from and what's your question? Hi, I'm calling from Twin Cities, Minnesota. And um, my question has to do with what sorts of groups were you able to work with um, at the local level, you know, not, you know, indivisible and all that, you know, real proactive political groups, but I mean, were you able to get support from unions or from, you know, rotary clubs or I don't know, whatever, whatever you thought was um, helpful? Well, thank you for your question, Sharon. For us, we really started it within our democratic group. And um, members within that democratic group would talk to their friends and their neighbors. Um, like Rotary, it was not really a place to have those conversations or the Lions Club. But when you step outside of those meetings, you may know people who are like-minded and you can reach out to those people. So um, that's how we did it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking of one person who came to the public testimony, um, a, a concerned New Hampshire citizen, a former state representative himself on the on the right side of the political spectrum who, you know, made the case for why we need to patch, pass 504 through, you know, sort of the, the lens of capitalism that, you know, money in politics is bad for good, honest mm -hmm. capitalism. It, it perpetuates crony capitalism and you know, those are often the conversations that we're starting to find are, you know, really um, possible to have productive conversations with rotary clubs and with small business owners across the country is, you know, to, to win this, we're going to need to bring in more voices from all, all facets of society that's being affected by this. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Let's go to John House. John, where are you calling in from and what's your question? Uh, hi, I'm calling from uh, actually Avon, Colorado. Where I'm on vacation, but uh, I'm uh, in from the Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, Senator Levesque, I understand that your bill at 504 uh, had a gerrymandering component. I'm wondering if that was just the state districts or also federal districts. And then my question. Second question is, what would you say is the most compelling argument in favor of getting rid of gerrymandering? Well, um, thank you for your questions, John. Uh, the the bill, which I shepherded through, I did not. I was not the author of the bill, but the bill called for to end gerrymandering of, at the state on a federal level. So for our federal delegation to, um, to end that practice for each state. So I hope that answers your question. So it would be for all levels of government First part. Um, that we have districts for, but to do it at a, at, at a federal level so our entire country could get rid of gerrymandering. Great. So, and what um, was the most compelling argument you thought that or the, that uh, helped get that passed? Well, I think the the idea that we are 
you know, we want people to be represented, not for representatives to be, be chosen um, based on other representatives. They should be chosen by the people. And when we have a gerrymandered district, it is done so, so that oftentimes the party in power has more power and retains their power. And therefore, they don't, it's not a true representation of the people. And I, yeah, I have to say, I really like what Eric Holder said about drawing, drawing those lines between gerrymandering and a government that does not work. Because I have seen people who have been um, basically primaried out of their position because they're working with the other party. And it really should not work that way. We need people in government who will work together and find solutions to our problems. And Azor might Perfect. have some other others too. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's actually a, a perfect note um, to conclude on, Senator. Um, thanks everyone really for the for the thoughtful, thought provoking questions. And let's all give a big thanks to Senator Levick for taking the time out of her vacation to be with us tonight and really for championing this issue and delivering this victory. So thanks again, Senator, just, a, just an honor. Thank to you, you for having me and um, all the best to you. Thank you all for taking on this cause. It is so important. Thank you and have a good night. Fantastic. We will, folks are on mute, but if they weren't, I'm sure they'd all be saying thank you right back and enjoy the rest of your trip. And with that, I'll pass it back to Rosie. Uh, to take us thank through the you. rest of the call. Bye. Yeah, Bye. no, thank you so, so much, uh, Sam Levesque, for joining us. Uh, it was such an amazing talk. I've been, as you know, like, we've been working on this for months, and New Hampshire's been working on it for years, so to hear from the person that, like, helped get it through was really, really inspiring. Um, we're really excited to continue, continue this work nationwide, too. We're now halfway through the year. I know it doesn't feel like it. This year's gone by way too quickly. And I want to reiterate what amazing work you have all accomplished so far. So in 2017, APAs had 17 meters meetings, sorry, with elected officials and their staff. Last year we had 137. And as of last week, there's already been 62 meetings with elected officials and their staff. So that's huge. And then we've also launched five new APAs since January. So we're growing really, really quickly. One area, though, that we could improve uh, is media pieces. So we've definitely seen a lot of progress. In 2017, we published 26 media pieces. In 2018, there was 106 pieces published. And our goal for 2019 is 212. And halfway into the year, we're at 47, which isn't, you know, I guess on track, but I have more than enough confidence that we're going to get there. We know you guys are still up to this goal, which is why this month's action and training is focused on writing successful letters to the editor. So remember, we want to make sure we know about your meetings with elected officials and when you publish your media pieces so we can include them in our updated results for next month and give you guys a little pat on the back. So when you've had a meeting with your elected official or their staff or had a published piece, this can be in any type of editorial. First of all, congratulations. Uh, second, go to AmericanPromise.net, and at the top of your screen, click the Resources tab, and that's going to take you to our reporting forms. It's also where you can check out the American Promise Resource Library, which is a pretty helpful tool we put together for you and your group. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Ellen, the leader of the Port and Clinton, Ohio APA, who will share her tips and tricks on how to write a successful letter to the editor or op-ed. The Port Clinton APA is a lean, mean letter writing machine. They've published 55 letters to their local newspapers, informing their community and elected officials on the importance of this issue. So, Ellen, you are now off mute. Go ahead and inspire us with your wisdom. <laughs> That's a pretty high order. <laughs> Thank you, though. This is Ellen from Port Clinton. Um, I, I guess I'm going to really try to talk about uh, – exactly how to write the letter, but how to motivate people in your groups to write letters. Because I think, you know, the worksheet that, that our uh, citizen uh, empowerment leader sent out, the July worksheet, really tells you sort of the nitty-gritty of 
of how to do the actual letter, but how do you get people motivated to write a letter? And so anyway, first of all, what I wanted to start with is um, within the last few days, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, uh, Vindicator announced that they are closing their their newspaper um, and totally closing it. It's uh, a daily newspaper. It has a, a area of about 500,000 population, you know, in about a 60,000 uh, population of the city. And when local papers close, um, studies have shown that it really does bad things for um, for democracy, actually. There's nobody reporting to the council. There's nobody reporting on school board meetings, court issues. Um, there's nobody that's a watchdog for, um, you know, what's happening within cities. And so um, it really is a terrible thing to have more and more what they're calling news deserts around our country. And the reason why I'm saying this is that um, I'm kind of motivated to write letters to the editor because I'm fortunate enough to have local newspapers, some of which are not, they're truly independent. They're not even, um, you know, kind of what they call ghost newspapers that are owned by big chains. So, number one, it's really important to support our local papers, and that includes reading opinions, writing uh, letters to the editor about opinions, subscribing, aging, and so forth. So, to me, that's a a really great motivation. Um, And I hope it will be for all of you, too. But also, we also get something else out of uh, writing letters to the editor, and that is a lot of people still read their local daily newspapers. So how have we been successful in Port Clinton? Well, the first thing is that we have designated one person to be the major letter writer. And hopefully within your group, you can find somebody that likes writing and is good at it, uh, can motivate people, can make it easier on other people, and can be the one basically that sketches out the rough draft of letters. Because it's, it's very hard for people to overcome inertia or procrastination or, or whatever. Um, designating one person also helps in that you're more easily able to establish content editors and the people that review the letters of papers, and they will kind of get to know you, and I think that's very helpful. Um, but that doesn't mean that the person who is the designated sort of major writer is the one that always sends in the letter. So what we do in Port Clinton is we sketch out a letter and then um, we have, uh, you know, we have kind of a big rural district and so there are a number of small papers and we know everybody in a lot of small towns around. And so they will, uh, we will send our letters out kind of far and wide. People will read them. They'll adjust them to their newspaper's word limit. They will change things up a little bit. And so we can write one letter, but it can really be very powerful in the sense that different versions of it can go to different newspapers. Now, the caveat to that is you have to be sure that your newspaper doesn't want an exclusive letter. For example, we know the Cleveland Plain Dealer demands exclusivity, and so we know if we want to really write a really powerful letter to them, you know, that will be a one, kind of a one shot, but it it has a big readership. Um, 
So how do we decide what we're going to write about? Well, I would say in Port Clinton, we really, we really look at local stuff. We've got a nuclear power plant they're trying to bail out here. We've got Lake Erie, algae growing. Um, and so there are a lot of things that we can look at in our own community to write an interesting letter about. Um, we, we kind of set a goal for ourselves for one letter a month. But again, that letter may have different depending on where we're sending it. Um, usually at our monthly meeting, as we're talking about stuff, we'll just get on a topic and somebody says, that'll make a good letter. And then we, we kind of sketch it out and go from there. Um, we also read the... Um, letters to the editor that other people write so that if it's an interesting topic, we write a rebuttal or a, you know, agree with kind of letter or build on a letter somebody else has written. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, we um, we send letters if if we're doing anything special, like when we had our dark money screenings, people wrote letters afterwards talking about those those screenings and what they meant to them. Um, we send so we send letters about events that we're organizing. If we get a letter published, we always post it on Facebook. And we also send a copy to our legislators, depending on what the issue is, either our state or our uh, federal legislatures, legislators. So those are the, some of the things that we have done that, um, that have made us able to, you know, get a lot of, a lot of letters published out there. Uh, and that is thinking about it in maybe a broader way and really having one person that's in charge and then we'll reach out to other people as needed once letters are kind of put together. If any other suggestions or questions, um, I'm happy to... Uh, you know, to listen to those because it's always it's always interesting trying to get people motivated to to get letters out. Yeah, no, thank you so so much, Ellen. I think that was very inspiring, and I definitely like the approach you took of like, yes, we have tips and tricks on how to write a letter, but how do you get that motivation to actually build up the courage to get there to that point? So thank you so, so much for sharing. I think I'll see if we have time for questions at the end. I just want to talk about this month's action real quick and the brief training. Uh, and then if we have a minute at the end, we can go jump into questions for Ellen. Uh, but really, Ellen, keep up the amazing work, uh, and you and your whole group. This month, we'll be writing letters to the editor, encouraging readers to contact their U.S. representatives and ask them to support House Joint Resolution 2, as well as acknowledging and celebrating the recent victory in New Hampshire. The specific language for HDR2 was sent out today and can also be found in our resource library. Uh, but if for whatever reason you have trouble finding it, feel free to let Kimberly and I know and we'll send it right away. Um, so some newspapers require that letters to the editor must be responding to a previously published article or editorial. If that's the case, look for a recent article that relates to the issue of money and politics. And trust me, they're all related to money and politics. Um, find an article that allows you to easily tie in the issue of money in our political system and be sure to express how attending your group's event or meeting is a way to address that problem. So I love how you share that, Ellen. We're like, oh, we're having a dark money screening. This is how that's related. Here's how you can work towards that. When people have a problem, they want to have a solution geared to that too. You can also mention that we're now more than halfway to our goal of 38 states, with New Hampshire now the 20th state to pass legislation in favor of this issue. Letting readers know the importance of a cross-partisan discourse around money and politics is also key, and how this is not a problem just one political party can solve, it's all of them. 
So urge your readers to contact their U.S. representatives and ask them to co-sponsor and champion HJ Res 2. If you saw, if you watched the Women's World Cup the other day, they now have those jerseys to say champion. We want our representatives to have those jerseys, but for campaign finance reform. And so if your member of Congress is already a co-sponsor, please thank them and then urge them to build more support in Congress. So finally, as I mentioned earlier, once you submit your letter to the other and it's published, congratulations. But then please, please, please let us know by filling out a citizen reporting form, going to our website and click on the Action Center drop-down menu, and you'll see the Citizen Uprising Action Reporting Form option. Fill out the proper form to let us know about your published letter to the editor. It takes about two seconds, and we can include it in next month's total. I now want to take just a minute or two to discuss our National Citizen Leadership Conference. NCLC will be October 19th to the 21st, jam-packed with tons of trainings, networking events, passionate speakers, and really all the tools you'll need to help your community become informed and engaged on this fight to win a constitutional amendment. I'm going to put the link to register in the recap email in case any of you haven't done so yet. Um, before I begin, uh, feel free to press 1 on your keypad. Would anyone who attended the conference last year have to say a word or two about the experience? Did your group have a high turnout? Did you feel inspired, rejuvenated? Um, I see Joan's hand is up. I'm going to go ahead and take you off mute, Joan. Uh, good. Where are you calling in from? And was this related to NCLC or was this related to Ellen's uh um, it, it, it was, I'm calling from a South Jersey Tri-County chapter, and, and actually it was related to, I had a question for Ellen, but I did go last year, and I found it uh, uh, very inspirational and sometimes overwhelming, but I'm going okay. again. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. Overwhelming in the good way, I hope. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, overwhelming is always you try to ultimately make it into be a good way. <laughs> okay. Thank you so, so much for sharing. I will come back to you for your question um, uh, to Ellen in a moment. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, so this October, we're going to D.C. to tell Congress that representation is for every American, not just the big money system working to overtake our democracy. We need a large, strong, passionate, and driven group of citizen leaders to join us and meet with as many lawmakers as possible. We're aiming for 100 meetings with congressional representatives, which I know is a big ask, but we're already on our way, which is why bringing multiple members from your APA is pivotal. These meetings are also some of just kind of the most inspiring and empowering experiences in the work that we do, which make it a really great time to introduce members of your community who aren't yet involved in American Promise, as well as members of your community who aren't yet involved um, in your APA or don't even really know about this issue. So we've worked exceptionally hard to make this conference as affordable as possible. I hate sounding like a salesperson, but I have like one small pitch for you all. APA members will always have the most affordable price, and we're also offering discounts for friends, colleagues, family members, and students. So when you're talking to your community members and family members and just people that you know, here are some just brief tips uh, and talking points for asking a person you know that's not involved to just join you at the conference. You can tell them that it's empowering. Uh, at the, our next Citizen Leadership Conference, we'll be connecting and networking with leaders across the country. Uh, it's informative. We're going to have several world-renowned speakers, such as Doris Kearns Goodwin and our president, Jeff Clements, along with tons of enlightening trainings and breakout sessions to help you feel engaged and ready to take on Congress. It's engaging. Uh, there will be really hundreds of participants from every corner of the country at this conference, and it will be really incredible networking opportunity to not only learn about the amendment pro process and this cause space, but also just connect with other leaders and people working on a wide variety of democracy reforms. People are interested in education, the environment, gun control. Any type of issue will be talked about here, and you can meet with people that are also passionate about that issue. So now is the time to say it's on. It's the theme of this year's NCLC. And then finally, it's focused on real action. Hundreds of trained volunteers will be going to Capitol Hill to take our message directly to our elected officials. Some questions that you, people might ask are like, where and when is the conference? So I'm going to make sure to put this in the recap email, but as I'm sure you all know by now, 
The conference is October 19th to the 21st in Washington, D.C. at the Hilton Crystal City in Arlington, Virginia. And then on the 21st, we'll be going to Capitol Hill. If they ask how much is a ticket, um, we're currently doing early bird registration, so that's $130 for the whole weekend. It covers food, all the trainings, and breakout sessions and panels. Uh, if you are in an APA, it's $100. And if you are a student or a youth member, it'll be $40. Um, so people might be nervous about, like, oh, I don't know anyone. I don't know about this issue. That's Kimberly and I's job and your job as well to just be like, we are here to support you day in and day out. American Promise is very committed to our support structure and making sure that you feel safe but also empowered. So we'll be sending along resources. We're happy to talk to anyone that's not sure about it. So if you look at, like a person that's kind of interested but not sure, feel free to send them, send us their contact information and we're happy to talk to them. Um, and we're also going to be there to support people wanting to start new chapters. So if you're a person like a neighboring district, it's like, oh, I don't really want to drive like half an hour, an hour to your APA, that's perfectly fine. We're happy to start new groups. Um, so we're all really, really excited for NCLC and to connect you with everyone that we'll be meeting with this October. We have about two or three minutes left. If anyone has any questions for what I just said about NCLC or to ask Ellen a quick question, feel free to feel I'm sorry, I'm stuttering. Feel free to press one on your keypad, and I already see hands are up. I will go ahead and call on Judy uh, Butler. Feel free to say where you're calling from and what's your question. Hi, Rosie. Uh, this is uh, Judy Butler from Delaware. Um, I just wanted to mention, I think I may have had an earlier call or a leader call, that, that um, if we do get an op-ed published, we always have letters to the editor waiting in the wings to be submitted in the next two to five days um, after the op-ed appears um, supporting it. <laughs> oh, that's a great tip. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and now call on John House. Go ahead, John. Say where you're calling from and what's your question? I didn't have a question. I just wanted to reiterate what was said earlier. I was at the, about the NCLC. I was, at, I was there last year. The uh, the speakers were uh, excellent and very inspiring. Uh, we've had Bill Moyers and uh, uh, former Representative Jim Leach and several other really inspiring people talking. And all of the uh, sessions were very informative, and it was it was just a great event. So I encourage everybody to uh, you know do everything you know go out and and uh, collect bottles and, and cans and sell them if you need to to get the money to, go to, to DC because that's uh, it's a really special event thank you so much John that means a lot we have time for one more and that's Joan uh, go ahead Joan say where you're calling from and what can I do for you uh, Joan from Tri-County South Jersey um, and my, my, actually, I, listening to Ellen Greenbush uh, sort of gave me a germ of an idea, and I just kind of wanted to throw it out and see if anybody had comments on it. It's not fully formed, but we've been doing some tabling um, at different community events, and as a result of that tabling, we got uh, people to, you know, sign uh, a sheet that said, oh, well, this is nice, we're interested in whatever. And I was thinking that maybe we could leverage that, that list and give, uh, you know, typically what we think to do is, okay, we're going to invite them to the next dark money showing or something like that, um, right. some other educational event. But I was thinking instead that maybe we should, le we should fold that into, make it like a workshop on writing letters to the editor, having these people who sign the sign-in sheet come to sort of, a training for writing letters to the editor, and we could provide, you know, with respect to, to this issue, and, you know, we could sort of provide some training, have it be an activity, and I'm not quite sure how to, how to you know, will the details, but I was just kind of wondering what people thought of that idea. 
Joan, you're a genius. I love that idea. That's really, really clever because that way you, you can give them a solution to feeling more engaged and you can help them with that training. And I'm happy to help with that as well. I think it's a really smart idea. I did, I did something similar actually in college when I was working on a, a political campaign when we were doing voter registration, but we mm-hmm. wanted to make sure they were engaged after. So we had a, um, once we had their contact info, we had had like a, had a canvas workshop after. So we'd use that list to do canvassing training, but I think using that for writing letters today would be a fantastic idea. And I'm sure uh, I would love to hear other people's opinions, um, but we can also talk about it at another time too. Yeah. Uh, uh- can I just say, uh, yeah, I think what I'll do is put it on the agenda for our next uh, chapter meeting, and we'll we'll kind of try to flesh it out there if people want to. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great idea. Um, that I love that. Like, thank you, everyone, for chiming in and just sharing all your thoughts with me this evening. Uh, I had such a great time talking with everyone and hearing from Senator Levesque and Ellen and Azer, too. It's good to hear from you, too, buddy. Um, we all missed you on these calls. Um, I hope this call was helpful. I look forward to reading all of your upcoming letters. Uh, Our next call will be August 12th, 2019 at 8 p.m. Eastern time. We at American Promise pride ourselves on being very prompt, so this is now the end of the July call. As always, Kimberly and I are here for you uh, if you ever need anything at all. Uh, Have a great rest of your week. I'm going to go ahead and take everyone off mute, so feel free and uh, say goodnight, guys. Have a great time.